Um, something a little peculiar about that, a little peculiar about Kant taking duties to others alone to be um, virtue. Um, so think about utilitarian. So we, we philosophers might develop a system of value like utilitarianism that has self-sacrifice as a component. Right? So utilitarianism says that we do have to sacrifice our own utility, our own happiness, when doing so is what? Going to increase the total happiness of others. Um, but notice that for a utilitarian, Self-sacrifice by itself is not valuable. In fact, it's a bad thing. It decreases utility. It's only good if it is made up for by, compensated for by increases elsewhere. So it's only good if it's helping other people achieve their good. So they have to be affirming their ends, their own goals, as valuable. They can't simply be self-sacrificing. We can't simply be self-sacrificing. There has to be a ground level where satisfaction is good. Um, so, you could say it the other way around. There's something that would be self-defeating. If everybody sacrificed themselves and there was nothing positive that was being affirmed there. Um, and yet, Morality, Nietzsche thinks, precisely makes self-sacrifice the highest virtue. Um, so there's something off about that. And Nietzsche is, is putting this, trying to identify this. Okay, one last crucially important point. So while Nietzsche thinks that the way morality places self-sacrifice and pity and compassion at the core of its system of value. That that's the highest value. Um, while he thinks that there's something mistaken about that, something nihilistic about that, uh, Nietzsche is not opposed to self-sacrifice. He's not opposed to helping others. Uh, he's not opposed, most of all, he's not opposed to limiting or disciplining oneself. He's opposed to valuing those things for their own sake. He's opposed to taking those to be the highest expression of value. And that's what he thinks morality tells us, to value those <coughs> things for their own sake. So I want to remind you of the passage in Daybreak 103 where I, where I quoted him saying, it goes without saying that, that I do not deny, unless I'm a fool, that many actions called immoral ought to be avoided and resisted, or that many called moral ought to be done and encouraged. But I think the one should be encouraged, the other avoided, for other reasons than either of you, for reasons other than the moral evaluation. So self-sacrifice, if it's done for good reasons, is a perfectly good thing for Nietzsche. Okay, so what we need, what we need uh, is a critique of moral values. This is what he's saying uh, on page 5, uh, section 6. For once the value of these values must itself be called into question. Um, and for this, he says, we need a knowledge of the conditions and circumstances out of which they've grown, under which they've developed and shifted. So in order to get clear about what the moral system of values is, we need to look at its history, trace its origins, um, and that's what the genealogy is doing. Um, and he ends the preface, section 8, um, basically with a kind of warning. Uh, and the warning is that you have to read carefully. 
He says, if this book is unintelligible to anyone and hard on the ears, the fault, as I see it, does not necessarily lie with me. It requires careful discipline and reading. Uh, in particular, he says um, that careful and precise reading takes hard work, uh, a kind of self-discipline, um, and um, you need to, he says, decipher what it is that he's read. Um, and he, he says he begins the third treatise with an example of an aphorism and how to unpack it. So when we get to uh, the third essay, we'll see that the, actually the first section is an aphorism, and the entire rest of the third essay is demonstrating how to interpret that aphorism. The entire third essay is an elaboration of, is an interpretation of that first section. Okay. On to the first essay. Let me see, I mean, I, I sort of wandered a bit there. Let me see if there are questions about what I was saying. So he starts by talking about, um, page 9, section 1, he starts by talking about these English psychologists. Uh, he has in mind what we would call moral philosophers, or moral, moral psychologists. Um, and he has um, a really interesting attitude toward them and their works. Um, first is, uh, he thinks that their work is really boring. However, he thinks despite their work being really boring, they are very interested. He's interested in them and why they write the way they do. Why their work is so boring. Why they're interested in their uh, subject. He says, uh, they themselves are interested. These English psychologists, what do they actually want? One finds them, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, always at the same task, namely of pushing the, he says, part pihon to, says, the, the shameful or embarrassing parts of our inner world into the foreground. What is it actually that always drives these psychologists in precisely this direction? Um, is it a secret, malicious base instinct to belittle mankind? One, who, one that perhaps cannot be acknowledged even to himself? Or is it so? Why are these psychologists always um, so interested in the muck? Why are they so interested in the shameful bits of human psychology? Well, maybe it's to uh, bring people down a notch. Or maybe, say, uh, he says, or say, a pessimistic suspicion and mistrust of disappointed, gloomy idealists who have become poison, poisonous and green. So maybe they were idealists at one point earlier in their lives, and they're frustrated with human beings and human history, and so now they're not trying to knock us down. Or a little subterranean animosity and rancor against, against Christianity, Plato that has perhaps not yet made it past the threshold of consciousness. Rather than thinking about some other world and valuing that, here, this is the real world. Um, or maybe it's just like troublemaking to spice up their own boring lives. Um, so the question is, why is it that they're drawn to these shameful parts of human psychology? Right, so this is a question about their psychology, not their work. Right? What is motivating that? And Nietzsche claims that he doesn't really know. He can only speculate, he says. He says, I'm told that they're simply old, cold, boring frogs who creep and hop around on human beings, into human beings, into our psychology. And if they were really in their element there, uh, as if they were really in their element there, namely in a swamp. So these 
sort of creepy old men are no better than what they're describing. Well, he says, I resist this. Still more, I don't believe it. And if one is permitted to wish where one cannot know, then, okay, so Nietzsche says, I don't really know the answer. I don't really know what motivates these uh, old men to uh, constantly be focused on this element of human psychology. I don't really know. But what I imagine, he says, and what I hope for, the way I picture these old frogs, then I wish from my heart that the reverse may be the case with them. That these explorers and microscopists of the soul are basically brave, magnanimous, and proud animals who know how to keep a rein on their hearts as well as their pain, and have trained themselves to sacrifice all desirability, like the way we would like to imagine human beings, to truth, to every truth, even plain, harsh, ugly, unpleasant, unchristian, immoral truths, for there are such truths. Uh, okay, so he's imagining these crotchety old English scholars as heroes, as he doesn't know if this is true, but this is his sort of ideal of them that they are disciplining themselves, overcoming their own personal insecurities, overcoming their own discomfort with this, to find what? To find truth. To find every truth, he says, even those that are most unpleasant. Um, what I find absolutely striking about this is that this is very high praise for me for these individuals who, on the surface, don't seem so heroic. But what Nietzsche is praising about them is precisely their disciplined appeal to truth. Um, these, of course, are not deep metaphysical truths. These are just the plain, ordinary, empirical facts about human beings and our inner motiv motivations. Um, I can't stress enough that Nietzsche is starting the book by presenting these individuals as a kind of ideal, heroic individual. Uh, he thinks they're mistaken. He thinks their view is wrong. He's going to criticize them. The substance of the view that they present is incorrect, he thinks. But nonetheless, they themselves are heroic to Nietzsche. They exemplify a kind of strength and self-discipline and devotion to truth that Nietzsche most admires. In later passages, later in the book, Nietzsche is going to praise strength and power and forcefulness. Uh, and it's going to be tempting to think of this as simply gladiators and soldiers. But that's not primarily who Nietzsche is thinking about. It's these scholars who are strong in their discipline and commitment to truth, who overcome the obstacles of their own desires and inclinations, in order to see things honestly and objectively. Questions about that? Okay. Section two. Hats off then to whatever good spirits may be at work in these historians of morality. Whatever it is that's motivating them, this is a, a great virtue and great strength that they have. Isn't that? Unfortunately, however, it's certain that they lack the historical spirit itself, that they have been left in the lurch for